Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're going to continue looking at Daniel chapter 11, verse 30. And we're going to try to put it on a line today just so we can see it much more clearly, the connection between the past and the present. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the time that we have here again this morning to open your word. And we invite your spirit to speak to our hearts and the hearts of those that are, are watching this video even later. We know, Lord, that uh, you have been showing us great light that reveals to us our need of you and uh, your love and goodness and power in, uh, in our lives. And so we just invite this work upon our hearts. We pray that you can help us to understand these passages that we look at today, that you can guide and direct us and correct any errors we may have in our understanding. And we pray for one another, for this movement, for your angels' care, and um, that you can help us through the trials that we face each day. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So yesterday we re-examined verse 30, and I wasn't happy with how we were doing it before, just things didn't seem to fit. And just to sum up this verse, so basically we know that this is a parallel uh, to Revelation chapter 8, where it's going to talk about uh, the fall of Western Rome. And here it's going to use the ships of Kittim, and the ships of Kittim, which I was trying to fit with the Visigoths, really fit with the Vandals. And uh, these are part of the Germanic invasions. And we, we didn't totally settle on exactly how we're going to address some of these symbols in or some of the historical application. But we did advance quite a bit in the uh, present truth application. So what we know about this verse is it's first showing the fall of Western Rome and then the adoption or mixture, or whatever we want to call it, of the syncretism of paganism with Christianity that occurs in the sixth century. So we have, well, it's completed in the sixth century, I guess you would say, uh, according to the st statement in the spirit of prophecy, that this masterpiece of deception, which is now uh, Christianity clothing paganism. So it's paganism clothed in Christian garb. And that's the Christianity that most people know. So Christianity is been extremely weakened, uh, not the Christianity itself is weakened, but the witness of Christianity, what people think Christians are, has been weakened by uh, the Catholic Church and its rise. And of course, this is a mixture of church and state, and it's something that we're going to see repeated in our history, the church and state mixing together. Now, we have these three steps, grieved, return, and have indignation. And then we also have shall do, return, and have intelligence. And so we're saying that the first three relate to the fall of Western Rome. And the last three relate to the mixture of paganism and papalism. So it, it, so it's a parallel, uh, three steps. Now, um, we also had some connections with 977 BC, and we're going to look at that briefly. And then in the print, so that this helps, this symbol helps connect, connect the Lateran Treaty with this chronology. So we're going to, we're going to put that on a line and we should be able to see it a little more clearly. A any questions about this at this point? Does anybody have questions? So for somebody who hasn't seen the study from yesterday, I suggest you see that study. That would help. Okay, so I started drawing this out. And what I have here, a lot of this stuff is left over from another diagram. So just kind of ignore that. So first thing, uh, I guess we're going to have the 15th day of the eighth month down here. This is 977. This is the dividing of the kingdom. More specifically, if I'm putting November 22nd, 977, it's going to be Jeroboam offering upon the altar in Bethel. Whether that's the best date to look at in 977, that's just the date I usually mark for 977. But it's not when the kingdom actually divides, right? This is, it's going to divide earlier. 
Um, but it's the only one where I have a specific date. I could have put the first day of the first month in 977, but really what's important here is 977 BC. Now uh, I'm going to get rid of this. Okay. From 977 BC, let me see here. Yeah. So we're going to have this. I'm going to have to move this over like this. So what we're going to have over here is, so this period of time is, uh, 1,543 years, right? Now, that's an inclusive count, okay? So I didn't uh, do the zero-year math, right? I just used regular math. I don't know if people can see that. I'm just going to make this as a larger font. So we're going to have 1,543 years, and then that means simply if I'm going to – we're going to put in here. I need another date in here. So I think I'm going to move this over. So the other date I'm going to put in is, now this is going to be in uh, 1543 AD. And I'm just trying to think of, so this is the date for the fall of Constantinople. So that's May 29th, 1453. Yeah, that looks familiar. So we get the fall of Constantinople, May 29th, 1543. So we know uh, that's going to be four years after the start of the second woe, right? So you've got the second woe, um, we used to mark like July 27th, 1449. So four years later, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. 14, 1543. So 1449 becomes five years later. Is that right? Shouldn't it be 1453? Did I do that wrong? Did I do that. Yes, 1453. So I just mixed those numbers around. I knew something didn't look right. 1453. There we go. Okay. That's better. Now, so simply, uh, we're going to have this, this period of time here between these. You can obviously see that the math is going to work out. So this would be 977 years. So 476 plus 977 equals 1453. That's correct. So we got 977 years between there. Um, maybe what should I do here? Hi, Dwight. So we got the ladder tree here. I'm just putting this on a line, trying to get this to. And then you're going to have, um, what am I doing wrong here? Oh, yeah, that's what I need. And then this is going to be 476 years. There we go. Okay, does that make sense to people? So you got 977 BC, there's 1453 years to September 4th, 476 AD, and that's the fall of Western Rome. And then you're going to have the fall of Eastern Rome is 977 years after that. And then 476 years after that goes to the Lateran Treaty in 1929. Does that make sense? Any questions? Did I do that right? It would seem to look right. Okay. And then we're going to have this June 7th date. So that was 53 years, if I remember correctly, between these two. Okay. So you get 53 years from the Lateran Treaty. And in this period of time, uh, we mark this, this is 116 days, that period from February 11th to June 7th. So we got Stephen's birthday there, and then we have this June 7th date. This is going to be John, Paul, two, and Greg. Okay. And this is the fall of Constantinople. And, uh, this is the fall of Western Rome. Now, the significance of this then is we have this, this connection between the division of Israel. So we, we have to decide why, why is that significant in this? But the fall of Western Rome being 1453 years inclusive count later, I think becomes significant in that we have 977 years between the fall of Western Rome and the fall of Constantinople. But then we have this 476 years. So that structure allows us to address this 476 years to the Lateran Treaty. So the fall of Western Rome, you now there's, of course, lots of history in there. So we have things addressing uh, 508 and 538. Um, so we can put a lot more dates in here. 
And what we don't have here at the end, so we got John Paul II and Reagan, June 7th, 1982, and we connect that to it was um, we had 14 or 13,431 days plus 490 days. And that is going to bring us to, anybody remember, the 13,431 days. This comes from the expression, uh, grieved, return, and have indignation. If we add those together, we get 13,411. 13,411? 13,431. <laughs> I, I was thinking about Daniel chapter 11. Okay. Um, I was doing another thing at the same time. Okay, so you add those together. Um, that's what you're going to get. Grieved, um, return, and have indignation. You add them together, you get 13,431. And you add 490 days, and that brings you to July 18, 2020. So it brings us to that date, which was the 26th day of the 4th. Okay, so those are, those dates are all correct. Some of these spans of time, of course, are not correct. I'm just going to deal with these later once we figure out some of this. Now, there was something to do with this period of time, this 53 years. And so 53 times 365.25 was uh, 19,358. And if we added the 116 days you would get 19,474 days between February 11th and June 7th. So we have two different spans of time that could be there. Now, when we take the next group of three, that is, he shall do, return, and have intelligence, those ones produce a number that is 19,000. I don't think I wrote this down. So six, two, and three plus seven, seven, two, five plus nine, nine, five. No, this one gives us 14,933. That's what it does. Uh, so 14,933. So yeah, we didn't, we didn't address what that would do. I should have had this all figured out beforehand, but I don't. Okay, so when we count from June 7th, 1982, it brings us to April 26th, 2023. So what would be the significance of that? So all I'm going to do is I'm going to add to this. So I'm going to go from this date to another date that I'm going to put over here. Okay, so we're going to have a date over here, April 26th, and we're just, you know, working this out, whether this is important or not. So that would be a period of... And, and that's going to be the uh, fifth day of the second month on the biblical calendar. So if I'm going to look at this span of time, this is going to be 14,933 days. Okay. And that number of days comes from they shall do, return, and have intelligence, right? So we're, we've got these two different spans of time from these two different uh, – Two different numbers, and I'm just making sure I got this. That looks right. Okay, so does this mean anything to us? Now, April 26 connects to July 18th because it's the 26th day of the fourth month on our calendar. So we have that symbol there. Now it's uh, 12, uh, 1,012 days apart. The sum of the divisors of that number is 2,016 which can represent 216, 6 times 6 times 6, whether that's significant. But I'm going to put this in because uh, I think this is interesting. Okay, so this is 1,012 days. Now, uh, the significance of this number is the octal is 1764. What's 1764? Anybody remember what 1764 is? And then we have to decide what's what's important about April 26, 2023, in some other way. So as Iran was pointing out in the chat, Capricar's constant. Okay, it's not quite. It's related to Capricar's constant, right? So one seven six four is 
the number of years from the stoning of Stephen to 1798, right? And if we go back from the stoning of Stephen, it brings us to uh, Jacob blessing his 12 sons, right? So in 1731 BC. All so, right. So it's um, 252 times seven is one way of looking at it. There's other ways you can do it as well. 49 times 36, I believe, is the other way you can do it, right? So so it's this number that we have that's related to Capricar's constant because Capricar's constant is the, the numbers are in a different order. I can't remember the order. 6174, I think. But anyway, it's it's related to Capricar's constant. And it's related to uh, the 2520 mirror or the 252. I don't know what you call the mirror. The one that goes, that ties all of these 2520s together. All the ones for Northern Israel all the way back. So so anyway, that's interesting about it. It's going to go from the 26th day of the fourth month to the fifth day of the second month. That's a symbol of 52. Uh, April 26, 2023. Do we have any event for that day? And we also have, uh, I should put in some of the divisors. It's 2016. The asterisk doesn't look right. I'll put it as a bullet point. Anyway, I'll fix that later. Okay, so we have we have these symbols that can tie this together, but we, we still haven't really solidified anything. We got symbols here of the 490. We've got symbols of the 2520. We have symbols of the prediction of July 18th that tie together. Anything else that we can see? Okay, I need to put in here. This is 19,000. How many days was that? Yeah, 19,358. Anything else that we can note about this? Any other observations? I'm just trying to think it through right now. Yeah. So this is this is a structure that we have so far. Yeah, you want to, you wanted your point to be sum of divisors, not the son of divisors. I, I like son of divisors better. Okay. All right. I then well, then I'll you, I, I'll once you change it, you, you <laughs> can change it to S O N, so that's fine too. Okay. So sum of divisors or the divisors, however you want to say it. So I guess really, you know, instead of just looking at the numbers, we look at the themes here, fall of Western Rome, the fall of Eastern Rome, that this should connect with 476 years to the fall of Western Rome to the Lateran Treaty is interesting in and of itself, right? Now, the 1,453 years giving us that 977, that's just naturally going to occur when you have a BC and an AC date. BC and AC, BC and AD date. So you're always going to have that. If you take those dates, you are going to get that number. But of course, that number is significant. The 1453 AD is an important number, right? So, so this all ties together in unlikely ways. Now we're going to have a span of time from uh, the Lateran Treaty to July 18th. That's going to be 81 years. And so we could probably look at some of the other spans of time and see what the significance is of those. What else? Anything else that we notice? Okay. So the, the main thing is we have, we have these dates and they're connected to, so let's go back to our document. So we're, we're, we're saying that he shall continue. So after 476, paganism is going to continue. And we're saying that this Papal thinking continues after 1798. There must be some other way to describe that. The idea is that even though the papacy receives a deadly wound, it's going to find a resurrection in uh, the two-horned beast, right? That's how we understand it, that the papacy receives this deadly wound, and we know that the United States is going to create an image to the beast that all the world should worship the beast and his image, which is going to relate to sun worship or to the Sunday. So that's the first one. So shall he do. And that's 6213 is the Hebrew number, but we're relating it here to these numbers. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence. What, what would we do with these 
So we're going to say that uh, when he returns, that's going to be the February 11th to June 7th, 1929, the Lateran Treaty. And then he has intelligence that's going to be June 7th. Now, the, the problem I have here is the so shall he do. This is the one that kind of, that I'm not so happy with. And now we're going to say that this is, in the historical application, this is paganism that it's going to do. And the idea is that it's going to continue to persecute or or to try to undermine Christianity in some way, right? Now, it can't really fight against it. It doesn't have the civil power in its hands, but it works in a way that it influences Christianity that has now does have the civil power. And now, of course, this has been going on for a long time. So there must be something more specific, right? So I, you know, I'm trying to look at the history of this. We saw that there was, uh, you know, prior to 476, these attempts at a revival of paganism, but they didn't really continue. But paganism really does continue in the idea of the Catholic Church. So the question is, what, what, what does it mean, so shall he do? Now, I've looked at this word sort of lots of different ways, but one way I didn't look at it was to just look at other verses. So I'm going to try it this way, because when we look up the word, we can get a definition of it, and that's always useful. Why is it here? What did I end up there? Okay, so Daniel 11, verse, it must have been doing something else. Uh, so this is 6213. See, it's kind of not responding. There we go. So we go to the 6213, go to the dictionary, and you can see it's got to do in its fashion, accomplish, make. Now, the form that it's in is called the nifal form. So it has a noon at the beginning of, of the word as a prefix. And that, instead of meaning like to make, it's to be made, right? So that's just the difference of the form of the word in Hebrew. So when it says, so shall he do, so shall he actually be done, to be done, to be made. So it shouldn't really be that he does, it's that he's done. So it could be to be done, to be made, to be produced, to be offered, to be observed, to be used. So we would need to look at that word in that form. And I'll just show you what I mean by the form of the word. I know you don't read Hebrew, or at least most of you don't. But you can see here uh, this word, which is, um, they say it's Asa. Where is this word here? It's right, right here. So 6213. And you can see, uh, pardon me, it's not in the nifl form. It's in the call form. I think I'm thinking of another word. Um, this just says, and he shall do. Okay. So I looked up the wrong word. I looked at the wrong word. So I'm wrong about that. It's not in the nifl form. It's just in the call form. So that means, it's a good thing I looked that up. That means to do. So he's going to do, to produce, to do, to work, to deal with, to act, to make, to produce, to prepare, to make, to attend, to observe, to acquire, to appoint, to bring about, to use, to spend. So there's lots of different things that it makes that are things that it can be. It can be making things and doing things and working, producing. So what is paganism doing is the question. It's, it's like we have this, it's, it's going to do, but to do what? Now it's saying, so shall he do. Well, I don't know if that's the form that it's in that would give us, so shall he do. He will do is just fine as well, or, or he does, but they put in the King James, so shall he do. Now he shall even return. So we understand the idea of returning. That means to turn about to take a different direction. And he's going to have intelligence. He's going to have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. But I just don't have a specific idea of what it is that he does. Now they're saying, so shall he do, he shall even return. But they're adding some words there that what he's going to do is he's going to return and have intelligence. That, that's sort of how I take the King James translators or, or, or taking this. He's going to act even in returning and having intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. 
But I'm not sure if um, that's the best way to look at it. I look at it as three different things. His doing, his returning, and his having intelligence. So what would his doing be? That is, what would paganism's doing be after it has failed? So Western Rome has fallen. Paganism, in a sense, doesn't now doesn't have the civil power, but yet he shall do. He's going to do things. He's going to do something. Now, lots of different things, like make, produce, prepare, make an offering, to attend to, put in order, to observe, to celebrate, acquire property, to appoint, ordain, institute, to bring about, to use, to spend fast. So all these different things can be to do. But that doesn't really tell us much about what it is paganism is actually doing. We know that it's ultimately going to have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant and that it's going to return. And, and still, you know, we, we have a present truth application for that. But we haven't really placed a historic application specifically where we would mark that. So just, just to go over this again here. So we're saying the paganism shall do. Now we put, he's going to do, he's going to make, he's going to continue after 7, 476. That would be true. He, he continues, and that is, he's going to return. But we don't have a date for paganism returning. We, we have one for the Lateran Treaty in our history. But we don't know what does it mean that paganism is going to return. He shall even return. Is there an event that we can mark? And then we know that he shall have intelligence. That is, of course, what's going to happen between paganism and papalism historically, between apostate Christianity. So I don't know how we would put this, whether we put this as influence Christianity. I don't know if that makes sense. So paganism shall do that is, we have there continue. So it's just, we're just saying that it continues. It doesn't stop. That's all we're saying about it. We're saying that it's going to have an influence with Christianity. It's, that's, it's intelligence, but we don't have a specific event for that. And then he shall even return. Well, again, we don't have a specific event in where paganism returns. And so, so we have some weakness here in this interpretation. Because it, it becomes a little more general, nothing really specific. And now we know that we have, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation. We've been able to, to figure that out. You know, 395 AD is when they grieve, they return, 410, and then they have indignation. That's just uh, the continuation of the 1260 years of the day, even after the fall of Western Rome in 476, right? So it's just saying that Paganism is still continuing, right? And then in this indignation against the Holy Covenant. And then it says, so shall he do, right? So now it's going to give us three more steps, the doing, the returning, and the intelligence. And so obviously this returning has to be a different returning than the first one, right? And so that's why we say the first one has to do with uh, the fall of Rome and paganism addressing that. Pagan Rome addressing their fall. Now paganism is addressing its fall. So paganism has to fall. It has to be taken out of the way. Now it's connected to Western Rome being taken out of the way. Um, let's take a look at Second uh, Thessalonians again. I still want to do uh, a word study on the word to do, but let's take a look here. Now we know Second Thessalonians is primarily going to address verse 31 the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the man of sin. But let's just take a look at this verse, what it says. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit or by word or by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, 
showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, that I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth. Now, um, that word withholdeth is going to be translated as letteth later on, and I'm not sure why. Not why they didn't just keep using the word withholdeth, but uh, now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the iniquity of, or the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now withholdeth, right? So it's got that same, same word, will continue to hold. He, he holds until he be taken out of the way, right? So this, we know that this is paganism, right? This is the idea taken out of the way had to do with the idea that the daily has to be taken, right? You shall take away the daily. So the daily has to be taken out of the way. And the understanding of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is almost universal that this is referring to, for anybody who's a Protestant, that this is referring to uh, the removal of paganism so that the man of sin, the papacy, can be set upon the throne of the earth, right? So she, he shall be taken out of the way. And then that wicked shall be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause shall God send them a strong, send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Okay. So we can see that this definitely relates to verse 31. Is there any way in which we can take what's here regarding how paganism is hindering the papacy? And maybe that is partly what is being described in what paganism is doing as far as uh, seeking to, to hinder Christianity. Because the question is, how does paganism hinder the papacy? How would we understand that? You know, pagan Rome. I mean, because when we look at pagan Rome, well, pagan Rome, you know, ends up creating this environment for the papacy to thrive. I mean, it's going to be basically paganism in Christian garb. So what does it mean that it has to be taken out of the way? How is it hindering or withholding? Isn't it standing in the way, in a way of speaking? Yeah, but how specifically? I mean, especially after 476. I mean, because we're not marking it being taken out of the way in 476. It's taken out of the way in 508. And so it's it's continuing to hinder even after Rome has fallen, you know, more than 30 years after Rome has fallen. It's it's still going to be hindering. Right. And then it's taken out of the way in 508. And then it takes another 30 years um, for it to be placed upon papacy to be placed upon the throne of the earth by France. Um, now, it's kind of interesting, too, because when you look at here at this, but now ye know what withholdeth, right? So that's this word, kateko, which means to hold down, to withhold, to seize on, uh, to stay, right? to hold fast. And then when we look at it in verse 7, it says, he who now leadeth, and it's going to have another word added to it, RT. And RT means uh, through the idea of suspension just now. And that's why he who now leadeth. So the idea is he's now hindering. So that's one thing we need to consider is that it, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. But he now leadeth. He now withholds until he be taken out of the way. So this hindering has already occurred, and it's it's the mystery of iniquity that appears to be already, to be doing this work of holding. Does that make sense? Or is it that the mystery of iniquity is the thing that needs to be revealed that's being held? Maybe that's a better way to look at it. I think that's probably better. So we have this mystery of iniquity that's already working, which is going to be related to the man of sin, but it's being hindered by pagan Rome, by paganism, because paganism is what's taken out of the way. And it's now doing that. 
but we need something more specific of, of how it does that. Could it be partly because of the persecution that is occurring, that that hinders the papacy from rising because Christians are more dependent upon God? The, the church isn't going to really help you in that, that regard. So this idea of withholding that, that this is something that God is having, that he's allowing this persecution to occur. So can it relate to the persecution that's happening under paganism? Does that make sense? Well, we know it'll purge and re refine his church. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about twins, how they will compete with one another and yet how they, they are bound, you know. And I'm thinking, okay, Jacob and Esau, the supplanter, and how, you know, the guy was grasping his brother's heel. I thought, oh, that's what, what, what they're like, paganism and the papacy. You have many gods, and all of a sudden you have one god who's declared to be the global ruler, who is declared to be Christ on earth. There is the rivalry right there, and one just kind of flows right into the other. Okay, so, so I if you want to look at it that way. Okay, yeah, and the idea, though, is that there is this persecution happening. That's that as long as Christians are being persecuted by paganism, it's not going to allow Christianity to be this man of sin. That is, there's a characteristic that, you know, the prosperity of the church having the civil power, I mean, that's part of it. So the whole idea of the mystery of iniquity, this goes back to Lucifer, right? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it has to do with, with pride. It has to do with self-exaltation, usurpation. This is a characteristic, uh, which we're going to look at in detail on our Friday night studies when we look at A.T. Jones' appeal for evangelical Christianity. And Jones makes a case, and, and I would agree with him, that if we at all manipulate, whether with rhetoric, whether with any sort of even personal force, like in, in an argument, like raising our voice to try to make our point, uh, that is any type of force that's used to, to convince somebody sort of against their will, any sort of intellectual coercion, is the spirit of the papacy. It's the spirit of Satan. That is, we believe that the truth is the truth and the truth has a power attached to it. And that we present the truth, we live the truth, and that will eventually win out, even if it appears to be losing in the present time. So people very often believe that they're correct, and they sometimes are correct, and they shut down conversation, discussion, uh, they misrepresent others, they bias people against what other people are, other people, so, you know, that's ad hominem sort of way of addressing an issue. And they think because they're right, the end justifies the means, because these people are teaching in their mind error. And yet we know in the end, because the mean that the means are wrong, the end can never be correct. It will never produce the end that you want if the means are wrong. Right? Right. So even though this mystery of iniquity is already existing in Paul's day and and we know that we can attach this to the spirit of Antichrist as well. This idea that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh. There is there is a, a theological issue that is existing even in the time of the apostles that is undermining the gospel. And a lot of these things come from Greek philosophy and other influences in paganism. And these are going to grow within Christianity. But we have paganism itself as an enemy. That is, Christians are being persecuted by the state, which is pagan. And as long as that is occurring, it's going to hold back or withhold the man of sin. That is, once the state is connected to the church, then this allows for the man of sin to be revealed. That I mean, that's pretty clear. It doesn't, it, I mean, if if you have a papal attitude, but you don't have civil power, you can't really exercise any power. I mean, you can exercise a bit of manipulation and here and there. But once you get the power of the state, that's really the issue here. We, we, we agree with that. 
the power of the state. That's yeah. what a man of sin. It's, sorry, so, Peter, it's like that old saying, if you can't beat them, join them. Well, we couldn't force them to join us by persecuting and killing them. So now we're going to insinuate ourselves into everything that they're doing, infiltrate and corrupt from within. A little evidence, a lot of evidence these days. We'll leaven a whole lump. Yeah, so what we end up happening is is Christianity becomes the state religion, you know, for political reasons. But pagans obviously don't accept that. But they can still be pagans. They can still have their influence within the church. The, the, the idea is that they want to have their influence. They want to have their way of thinking. Their way of thinking is still going to predominate. So what you see in Catholicism isn't really in the spirit of Christ at all. One is it's it's seeking civil power, as if that is what the gospel was about. Right? We see that in the Catholic Church today, their belief that somehow the way that the world is going to become saved is that the Catholic Church is going to use this civil power, not just the power of the gospel, but a civil power to bring about this kingdom on earth, right? That's still the Catholic views ideas, the Catholic view, right? That's their, their goal. It's definitely not a gospel goal. And, and they often use whatever method they can, even the methods of deceit, to bring about their goal. And lots of people follow this, this plan. The idea is that I have a goal, and I'm not going to be open and honest about what that goal is. I'm going to say the things that, you know, people will want to hear. This is like political, right? I want to have power and I'll say whatever I need to say to get elected or whatever it is to get that power. But once I get the power, I have a different idea of what I want to do with that power. Because obviously I know best, but if I told people uh, what I was doing, um, then I would never... I would never gain that power. We saw that with Parminder, right? He, he, he admitted to being dishonest and his justification was, well, if I told people I was a liberal, then I would have no place in the movement. So I had to pretend to be conservative. That was Parminder's position. And so he openly admitted to being deceitful. That's disgusting. Yeah, right? Psalm 55, 21. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet were they drawn swords. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so my my belief is that we need to, truth is what matters. And we have to believe in the power of truth. We have to believe that if we tell the truth, if we live the truth, then the truth will win out in the end. So that's all that matters, that we have to be honest. We have to be open as the day. We can't withhold some of our motives or some of our ideas because they might not be accepted. doesn't mean that we we don't. In sharing those ideas, we may realize they might not be accepted and we try to give good, solid reasons for it. But they need to be solid reasons, not deceptive reasons. So we need to figure out some way in which we can market this in history, how paganism is restraining or withholding the rise of of papalism, some events, right? So not just this general idea. Now, we did look at, of course, at the before 476, but I I really think that we need to look after 476. And that might take a little bit of work, finding that information. So if we go back to our diagram again, so one of the things we see is and the other thing I don't have in here is I, I, I need 1798 in here somewhere. That's the thing I'm missing. Uh, so I'm going to do it in this way. I'm just going to move some stuff over. Let me do this here. So I want to put 1798 in the middle of this. Um, and of course, this is important. I don't know how this is going to fit in. It's not going to be uh, none of this is uh, proportional. Okay, so we've got February 15, 1798. So this is going to be 131 years between these events. And then here you're going to have 500 and, what is that? 
345 years. 345 years here. Add those together, they give 476. Okay. And then you're going to have uh, 184 years. Now, of course, we know this is the fall of Papal Rome. You have the fall of Papal Rome, fall of Constantinople, Eastern Rome, fall of Western Rome. And then you have a revival of the papacy, so to speak, with the Lateran uh, Treaty, having intelligence, so shall he do. Is there any way we can put July 18th? 1870 in here, the papal infallibility. There's some, I know there's not a lot of room in the chart. <clears throat> Oops, get this over. Would that be on this chart or could that be on a different line altogether? Yeah, I don't know. Could be on a different line. I mean, we have it on other lines, but I'm just saying we got July 18th, 2020 in here. You know, so that 150 years from July 18, 1870. July 18, 2020. Okay, so one thing, um, I don't know, maybe this gets too complicated, but, I mean, we have a lot of symbols here, but I don't see a continuity. I don't see, I don't see that everything's really connected. I mean, we put some dates, some spans of time, just seems to me something's missing. I don't see the complete thread weaving its way through all of this. Sorry that I'm having to think so much, not talk much. So we've got that 91 year period. Yeah. Uh, 91? Isn't it, isn't it 91 from 1929 to 2020? Okay. You're right. That's 91 years. Yeah. Cause that's 61. Or that's 71. 71 plus 20. 91. Okay. So we've got 91 years. It's 91 years plus some number of days. Yeah. So 91. And if you're going to count right from June 7th to July 18th. Right. Yeah. So you're going to have 30 plus 11. No, it'd be 40, 41 days, right. Yeah, 41 days. 91 years and 41 days. So how many days days are we talking about in that total span? 33,248 days. 33,248 days. If you count from February 11th, it's 33,364 days. Yeah, I don't know. There's just, it seems to me like, again, we, we're missing some things. Right. You could put 321 in there somewhere, I guess. March 7th, 321, Sunday law. Yeah, I know what you're saying. So put that back in, in this history, back in there. Anyway, it, it, it gives us some intriguing connections, obviously. There's just things that, well, it's not that they're not fitting. They're just not, they're just not tying everything together. There needs to be something that can tie this together more clearly. I mean, it's interesting. We have the June 7th to June 7th. So that's going to be 53 years. Uh, exactly. Obviously, if you add the 116 days, it's going to be longer. You count from February 11th. Yeah, so there's still lots of questions. To understand the history of the what the, it's that they're going to do, do what specifically, how would we define that? Can we give an event for it? And, you know, maybe there is some event that w- would be really, really clear. And we know from the fall of Western Rome to to 508 is going to be what, 36 years. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, 30... Um, 32 years, 32 years from the fall of Rome to 508, and then another 30 years to 538. We don't have that history in there. And is there anything, is there anything at all that is of import of that 570 years from the fall of Constantinople to April 26th of 2023? Okay, so you're saying from 2023 to 1453. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, I don't know 570 if there's any. How many days would there be between the fall of Constantinople and the April 26th date? Well, the exact number of days, because I'm dealing with one, four, so it's going to be, I have to think here. Well, it's like something like uh, 280,330 or something like that. I can find out exactly. Okay. No, it's actually a bit different. So... So what date does it fall there? That's going to be May 29th. Okay, that I didn't take into account. 
May 29th. Okay, interesting. May 29th, 1453 is June 7th on the Gregorian calendar. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> it's JFK's <laughs> birthday to the first Catholic president of the U.S. May 29th. It's 1917, May 29th. Is that has okay. any significance? Yeah. That's got something interesting to it as well. Okay, so June 7th, Gregorian. That ties three June 7ths together, which is, which is good. Because those are all uh, Gregorian dates then. Right. Um, so then the number of days makes it easier to count to June 7th, right, for that 476 years. And then for the extra, so I could count there. But where we get to, to July 18th, it's going to be different. Because you were asking about, okay, which period of time did you want to know the number of days again? The 570 years? Yeah, well, I'm... I'm looking at this right now just to, to see from the fall of Constantinople to the April 26th date. Oh, all the way to the April 26th date. Okay. So, and that's 570 years. Yes. So there we would have 208,137 days. Hmm. Is right. Okay. So from the fall of Constantinople to April 26th is 208,146, right? I, I used, I used the June 7, 14. Okay. They, they changed that to Julian. Sorry. Yeah. So you got it. Yeah. So you have to use the Gregorian date. May 29th is the June. Well, so, no, okay. Keep going. Yeah. So if I go from May 29th, 1453 Julian to April 26, 2023, it's 208,000. 146 days. That's the, yeah, it's going to take a bit more analysis here. Hmm. Okay. Well, we're going to leave that for today and then we'll come back to this tomorrow. So it's kind of interesting, but still not totally satisfied with what we have. Okay. Let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. We ask for your continued presence throughout the day that you can bring us together again to study your word. We pray for each person. You know the trials we face each day, the work we have to do, and um, the struggle with self. And so we just pray that you can work in our lives. Thank you for all the things you are doing. May your angels watch over our family and loved ones. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.